So guys, thank you all for being here. We have a lot to talk about because this is a very busy show. <laughs> and uh, let's start at the end, though, because uh, you know there's some things that happen there at the end of First Ventures that a lot of fans, I'm sure, have a lot to say about, a lot to ask about. So let's talk about the deaths. And you know, when you're approaching something like that, these are big deals. These characters are very important. How did you decide uh, who wasn't going to make it uh, to the end as you were planning out season we, five? We didn't want to kill anybody, but Denise, <laughs> as usual, <laughs> the darkness insisted that we had to fulfill the mandate from the pilot onwards when no one makes it out alive. And, and you know, we largely let her drive the bus on that one. <laughs> yes. Um, no, I think I think we had we had laid out from the beginning that this was going to be a show with stakes where we, we weren't interested in doing the 400th episode, we weren't interested in doing the sort of spin it out forever. Uh, we wanted to tell a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, and it's been a great, the way that it's worked out, it's, uh, it's been a great privilege to be able to do exactly that. But that always, <clears throat> that was always predicated on loss and change. Yeah. Um, and, you know, broadcast television, not always crazy about taking those sorts of risks, but we sort of built it into the show from the very beginning. I think in a weird way, her dying was in, in some sort a completion of her arc. Mm -hmm. You know, she died and she sacrificed herself to save Finch, and we got to see the next evolution, the next step with the machine adopting her personality and her voice. And for, for me personally, when we were in the writer's room and we were talking about the finale and who else might perish, it became also a, a question about character arcs and, and what we had left to tell. And I think, you know, with Reese and Finch, there's such a strong story of, of redemption with these characters. And for me, having Reese perish um, was the completion of his arc, that he actually could finally repay his friend for giving him a, a new purpose in life. Let's, let's talk a little more about the machine. Uh, because as you said, you, know, you begin the show with this core concept and there's this idea of this AI. But then the show goes on, and you know you're, you have to sort of evolve that, and how you how are you going to depict that on screen? So what was that like for you, sort of always coming up with uh, what would the machine be? You know, I know I've asked you in the past, you know, what would its voice be, which in the final episodes becomes very specific. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, were there many conversations? We told you that. <laughs> yes, yes. And actually, someone had asked. It's funny. We went to Comic Con. I think it was uh, prior to season three. We got a question about. Um, you know, will the machine ever get a voice? And 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 we had said there, we said, it, it, you know, it's going to get a voice, and you're not going to like it. And the audience all kind of went, "Whoa, what are they talking about?" And it's like, well, this is this is what that means. Uh, and one of the things I'm most most proud of with the show is the way that we, you know, a large group, very talented writers, all working together, all you know, and and very slowly building this kind of amorphous, you know, non-character character from the pilot onwards, um, you know, very deliberately. You know, you get to the end of the, the end of the first season is the first time that Reese ever hears, the, ever interacts with the machine directly. By the, by the end of season four, Finch is interacting with it in a way that's, that's emotional for the audience, you know, it's dying. Calibrating that journey from the machine being something that Michael and Jim's character talk about in Central Park, purely in the abstract, as a sort of a security apparatus, but knowing exactly where we wanted to go with it and managing to pull that off one step at a time to where we wind up in the finale, sort of in, in, in Finch's imagination, um, Amy as Root, as the machine kind of appears and talks to him, and 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 finally, over the course of 103 episodes, you've landed on no. This is what the machine looks like. This is what it sounds like. This is how it thinks. And really growing a character from the beginning to the very end. Uh, it was really really cool and, and sort of and beautifully executed over the years. So, Mike, Michael, what did you think of uh, when you saw that was they, how they were going to wrap this all up? I, I thought it was appropriate that that Root sort of merges with the machine. It had been her the reason to live, it had been a godlike thing to her. In a way, it's sort of sacramental that she's now inside the thing, or the thing is inside her. We don't have to know exactly how all that happens. You had to do a lot of heavy lifting over the years, though, because you had to have increasingly emotional scenes with this computer, you know, who I'm guessing isn't the best partner in the, acting wise. So what was that like for you to you know, have to chart uh, everything that happened between them? I didn't think of it as a, as a difficulty. I, I mean, I, I do think that Tony Patin, script supervisor, is probably my greatest scene partner of all time. <laughs> because he, he always reads the other side of 
all those scenes, who, you know, whether I'm, whoever I'm talking to uh, electronically or whatever, it's always his voice coming out of the darkness. So I just, I, you know, you get used to that after a while. And, it, and as far as the gradual humanizing of the machine, that, that, seemed, uh, that seemed like a lovely thing to me, and I liked how that grew. I, it felt really natural and organic. It didn't seem like a stretch or anything or an abstraction, really. It just seemed like, well, if you spent you know, a good chunk of your life making a tool that has language mm -hmm. and decision-making powers, then how would you not begin to have something like affection or a parental feeling for it? So for my money, that, that was some of the real goods of the show, at least for me as the actor playing Mr. Finch. Mm -hmm. I always loved that stuff. Do you recall, uh, how did they sort of tell you guys how, what, how the ending was going to go and what the <laughs> fates of all the characters were? You know, did you just find out via script or did you have a big conversation about it? I, is it all right if I say I don't remember ever having a conversation about that exactly? We did talk a little bit. Your character's turn through this season, Michael, was, it, was something we were very excited about. And that sense of Finch throughout, throughout the seasons, throughout the entire run of the show has been kind of the moral compass of the show. And, and, and Finch has very much set the rules for how they're going to engage and how they're going to fight back. And, and you know, when you're working with such a fantastic actor, you say, well, that's, it's wonderful to have spent you know, 90 episodes with such, such intellectual and moral rigor. But wouldn't it be fun to see him <laughs> blow to pieces? I don't want to see that veneer crack a little bit mm -hmm. and get a sense and get a chance to really, to really play with the character a little bit. So we talked about that before we started shooting anything this season, knowing that we wanted to, we wanted to take, um, um, take Finch in, in that, I was in not a, not a dark direction, but, but just a direction in which he has to wrestle with these rules that he's been fighting with for so long as things really start to, as the wheels start to come off. Mm -hmm. The world building became very, very impressive, and uh, you know that you have so many different organizations and all these different elements. Uh, and I say this with complete affection, I promise. But it's funny because sometimes I would be, have to be like, "Okay, oh, wait, wait. So wait, Decima is doing this, and like, <laughs> <laughs> doing this. right, right, right." Um, you know, for you, Michael, working on the show, was it kind of funny for you? Did you have times where you're trying to kind of chart all the different organizations they were throwing at you and all these different groups? Has it started to build one upon the other? There, there was a period there on the show where it was a pretty full house. There were a lot of operators, a, 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 a lot of organizations. I mean, mostly they were our enemies. So, I mean, we could have kind of a, a, a unity of attitude about all of them. But it was, some days you'd, you'd have to stop and think, no, these are the, oh, these are those other bad guys. <laughs> right. You know, bringing in characters like Elias, you know, you, you never know, you know, that, that's a character obviously you were seeding, but then there's other people that you might just bring in thinking they're going to be, a, you know, one week and then they take off. I mean, Michael, even on Lost, you had a similar situation where you're supposed to be on a few episodes. It turns into something. So was there, a, you know, for you guys, was there a character that you kind of were surprised by where it took you as you just were like, everything's working right, we need to do more with this? I feel like Root's character was that character for us, yeah. Amy Acker. Mm -hmm. I mean, she came in and she really... <clears throat> She stole the show. And as Jonah said earlier, they were so great together, Finch and Root and, and Root and everyone, really. Mm -hmm. And you would put her with you know, any different character, and they had such amazing dynamic. And so we just wanted to keep writing her more and more. And she kind of evolved that way for us, I think. It did strike me, uh, you know, because Root and Elias die in the same episode. And I was like, those were both, they were both introduced pretty much as villains or certainly antagonists. And yet they both have these sort of emotional, they're, they're very meaningful to your character, both of them amongst other people. Uh, was, you know, for, the, for you guys, was it fun for you to see how a character like that, you could really sort of morph and change who they were when we started to who they were at the end? Uh, I think writing the villains was the most fun on the show. <laughs> and you know, eventually you humanize all of them or they become sympathetic to a certain degree. And we, we, we'd war over that in the writer's room. Uh, but of course, Enrico's character was so fabulous at playing it. I mean, you understood his backstory. Same thing with Leslie Odom Jr. when he came on the show. When you finally understood that character's backstory and, and how he became, you know, the sort of <coughs> anti-surveillance uh, um, vigilante or terrorist, whatever you want to call him, uh, it, 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 you totally understood. 
And it was, it, those were the, m the most fun characters uh, for me to write uh, and the least favorite calls I had to make with Joan and Denise. <laughs> Just starting out, you, Shaw got kind of a, a big spotlight episode, a uh, great introduction. Uh, but that, it was that interesting when you see, you know, like you were talking about, you've, you've got Root and Finch go on sort of a road trip and you see what that's like. Mm -hmm. And then you've got Shaw and Root who start has, you know, in a scene that you now did of many callbacks to, but you know, there's, there's, there's some torture involved. There's right. like, it does not seem like things are gonna go well for these two. <laughs> what was it like for you guys to see, you know, where, where that dynamic took you, the, the two of the characters there? That was always exciting and fun mm -hmm. to write because I think we didn't, for me personally, I, I didn't really know. It, it, we were discovering it along the way as well. And they just, those ladies had such great chemistry together, starting off with the, the torture that you mentioned, the <laughs> iron. Um, and it was kind of undeniable. And it was interesting to me too that you had someone who was so, um, you know, she, she has a personality disorder, so she can't really feel the way other people feel. And then you have this other person who, um, is a killer and feels kind of feels everything and l allows herself to feel everything you know so it's like those two were such an interesting dynamic and I feel like the the finale was kind of the completion of their story mm -hmm. in a way you know she Shaw didn't really get to say or goodbye to Root and she finally gets to um, say goodbye to the machine and therefore say goodbye to Root in a way and then at the end she's got you know she's got the new version of the machine in her ear. Right. So it's kind of, it, it, was, it was an interesting like, path to go down. And I think, for me, I didn't know we were gonna go down this way, but it evolved that way. We knew it, because I, I directed that episode. <laughs> and, uh, Amanda Siegel co-wrote it. <laughs> yeah, and I had joked with Amanda before we went in to shoot that scene. I was like, I'm English, man. I'm not, we wanna get some, some sexual chemistry out of this scene, because it's clearly there, it's you know, in the subtext of it. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I'm not going to be able to direct that, so I was Amanda. Wait, when you're... you say you're English, does that mean you're repressed or you're a pervert? Which one is... <laughs> <laughs> probably, one probably both, I guess. Half, yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, repressed pervert, I guess, <laughs> you know, most of the English population. Uh, but it was that kind of thing of, you know, terribly embarrassed. How am I going to tell, how are we going to tell these ladies that we want to sort of, to, that there's a subtext here. And subtext, we very, when you work with very smart actors, they don't often miss things, but occasionally you have to kind of nudge a little bit like, well, we really wanted this to have a bit of a, a bit of a thing there. And uh, I had schemed out with Amanda how we were going to try to get that flavor out of this scene. Um, and uh, this is when we knew we were going to work with Amy Acker for a long time to come because Amy wandered over and I hadn't worked uh, directly with her as a director. So I was sort of talking through the scene and Amy said, I think there's a, there's a bit of a, there's a bit of a sexual thing here, isn't there? Right? And Amy's not that person, but it was like, okay. And she says, how about, how about I, um, would, it be, would it be okay if I sort of like pulled her in close and leaned in really close to her? And, and we're just kind of going, yeah, that would be great, Amy. That would be, that would be exactly what we're looking for in the scene. When you find that chemistry and you find that connection between two characters and, and two actors, you've got you to follow it, you know? The show, you know, always had that foot into sci-fi with, you know, the machine, which again, it's like, you know, everyone's like, hey, something like this is coming. And then, of course, there was some stuff that seemed like it's already here. Uh, but for you guys, how much did you also have to sort of make that debate about, you know, wh what's 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 the line as far as when we're getting, oh, this is not person of interest if we got, if, if a robot started walking around as like, I am the machine, you know, did you have conversations about, you know, how far you could go with that? We definitely had a lot of conversations about that and uh, drones and all that fun stuff that, that's out there now. I, I, you know, it's, I, I was cleaning out my office the other day and I came across the beat sheet that Jonah handed me five plus years ago and it was a novel for most people. It was massive, <laughs> the pilot, uh, but what was, was remarkable about that document uh, is how much of that material we continue to use further on, even past season one. I, I think some of that material just kept pushing out. Uh, and that's kind of when I, I think I knew we, the, that we had something special here in terms of, you know, obviously the, the genius of what Jonah came up with was there was an engine, but there was something else about this show and it had something to say. And I think, you know, obviously uh, just watching, I think when we were shooting the pilot uh, as well, there was uh, um, one of the first Google cars drove by with the camera on top of it, which we later actually had in one, in a, one of the episodes. Uh, and, you, you, and it was just this bizarre moment where you're like, what is that thing? And then it just became commonplace and it continually happened where life imitates POI over and over again, whether we were talking about the surveillance state uh, or we started talking about artificial intelligence in a greater level. Um, 
I think for me, that's one of the most rewarding things about the show. Here today, we're talking about Apple needing to build a back door for the government, you know, in, in our cell phones. And, and you're sitting here going, hey, guys, <laughs> this show, I hope it becomes an adjective someday, like Orwellian, person of interest, like find an adjective yeah. to describe uh, what this show <laughs> has done. Because I, I get it over and over, and we all did uh, from our relatives and friends, and they send you stuff, and they're like, this is happening. And you're like, yeah, we. You've yeah. kind of been talking about that. When the Snowden moment, the Snowden revelations were this sort of watershed moment. I think that happened season two into season three, yeah. where people realized, oh, we sort of dismissed this thing as, and I remember reading the article, you know, the, the reviews of the pilot. I don't remember what you guys said. I'm sure it was very positive. Uh, <laughs> but the, sort of the reviews of the pilot were uh, a little far-fetched and kind of goofy. It was sort of in the realm of like, you know, shows where you get tomorrow's newspaper today, or you get, um, where you have a magic, you know, a set of magic dice or a magic eight ball that tells you who's going to be murdered somewhere in Manhattan. And it was sort of in, in, in the genre of those shows where we were sort of quietly saying, no, 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 this is very real and we're trying, to, we're trying to figure out what happens next. Google has had for many, many years known far more about us than even it knows what to do with. Hmm. It's like, uh, you know, it can see, you know, because its core business is telepathy, basically. Yeah. You know, what do you want to buy? is basically what a business is, but, but you get all sorts of other information that comes out of that. And, and it'd be, I mean, elementary for Google to, to look at people's searches and know if they're suicidal, homicidal. I mean, that's more information than, certainly than they know what to do with. I mean, no one's quite figured out, um, they haven't figured out what to do with that information and no one's quite figured out how responsible to hold them for that sort of thing. But it's just one example of, you know, the, the sort of, the, the big data aspect of the show um, poses so many interesting questions. But I think for me the show was always science fiction in as much as, I mean, you know, a lot of what we were talking about was real and it was frustrating not to see people, not to have people understand that. It's like, no, read the New York Times from 2005. You don't need to wait for snow. 2005 they were telling you that the NSA could turn on your phone, that it could turn on, you know, remotely activate the microphone even if it was turned off, as long as it had battery, as long as, you know, these revelations have been out there. We sort of put our heads in the sand a little bit with them. But for me, the show was always a genre show. You wake up one day and realize that everything you work on is genre because it's what you're interested in. And so it was always a bit of a science fiction aspect to it. I was never afraid of that. We had to sort of hide that in plain sight a little bit, but it was no surprise to us that the show grew, you know, grew in that direction because it was sort of baked into the recipe from the beginning.